joining us for Bible study on tonight. Our scripture for tonight will come from John 14, verses 13 and 14. That's John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And it reads from the New King James Version, And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Our song for tonight is Jesus is the answer for the world today. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way Jesus is the answer for the world today above and there's no other Jesus is the way Jesus is the answer for the world today above and there's no other Jesus is Father God in heavens, in Jesus' name we come. We thank you, Lord, for another privilege, another honor, another great opportunity to come before you. Now, Lord, we come thanking you that Jesus is the way. God, we thank you for this privilege and this honor to honor Jesus the Christ. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, that our lives will continue to roll on and be a blessing to others. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for keeping us in our right mind. We thank you, Lord, that you blessed us again to come to the house of prayer. We ask you to bless us now, Father God, that we will continue to be the people that you made us to be, that you saved, that you wrapped your arms around, and that you're keeping us. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless your word, that your word will fall on good soil, that we, Father God, will walk in your word, that men, women, boys, and girls will see your word in us, and glorify your name. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank God.
Jesus is the way. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is the way regardless of what you're going through and regardless of who, who you're with and who you're not with. Amen. Jesus is the way. He is the awesome and the amazing God. Our lesson tonight is focusing again on Mark chapter 5 in the New Testament. The book is St. Mark. The chapter is 5, and the verses are 1 through 7. And we will go farther tonight after we catch up uh, with where we've been so far. Amen. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 7 is where we are, is where we stopped on last week. And we'll try to pull it on through on tonight. Amen. Mark chapter 5. Verses 1 through 7 is where we are again. And uh, the, the whole pericope is found in verses 1 through 20. What do we notice about Mark chapter 5 right away? Jesus shows up and what happens right away? A man was changed. A man was changed. What happened right away when Jesus got off the boat? What happened? As soon as Jesus got off the boat, a man ran to him. A man that was out of his mind. A man that was living in the graveyard. I'm telling you, this man was living and residing in the graveyard. Let's look at Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And when, when we look at it, we notice this man, there was some differences about him. First of all, he had his dwelling. King James says he had his dwelling in the graveyard, in the tomb. Among the dead, he lived in the graveyard around dead people. Two weeks ago, somebody said they didn't mind living next door to a graveyard as long as it was a free house. <laughs> as long as it was a free house, they were fine with living next to the graveyard. Everybody else in the room said, don't give me no house near the graveyard. Everybody else was like, no, I don't want to have anything to do with the graveyard. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with the graveyard. So people are more afraid of dead people than there are alive people, aren't they? Why are they so afraid of dead folk? Why is that? Can they hurt you? Can live people hurt you? Yes. Well, why y'all don't want to live near the graveyard? Why you want to build your house in the graveyard? Go down there and get your plot. Huh? I guarantee if I built my house, you wouldn't visit me. <laughs> you can, they're selling plots down there, right down the road. They're selling plots. So here this man is. He's not afraid of the graveyard. The people that visit the graveyard are afraid of him. Amen? When you look at verse number one, it says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Galileans, and when he had come out of the boat, he is Jesus, immediately there came and met him out of the tombs a man with unclean spirit. There met him a man out of the tomb. This man came out of the tombs. He came out of the graveyard. Met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Verse number three, who had his dwelling. What does that mean he had his dwelling? He lived in the tomb. He resided in the tomb. His homestead exemption was the address of the tomb. He dwelt among the tombs. No one could bind him. No one could bind him. Not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. In all ways, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus, verse number six says something. There's a switch, there's a change, there's a, a direction moving in the other direction, in the other, in the other way. He says, verse number six, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, 
What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So tonight we're going to find out what his name is. This man is living in the tombs. This man has an unclean spirit. This man has supernatural powers. How do we know he has supernatural powers? He's breaking stuff. He's pulling stuff apart. He, he is tearing up chains. He's, he's breaking up shackles. When you go to court, sometimes they will chain you and shackle you. I saw brothers and sisters with, with stuff on their chain on their, their ankles, chain around their waist, and then the one around the waist had chain on their wrist. And if that weren't enough, they would take the chain and pull them behind them. This man in the tombs could not be chained. He's running crazy in the graveyard. When we look farther down through the text, we find out not only is he running in the graveyard, not only is he living in the graveyard, not only does he have supernatural powers, he was cutting himself. Let me tell you, evil spirit will make you hurt yourself. And any time you get to a point where you hurt yourself, it's an evil spirit. Either in you or influencing you. If you're saved, if you're born again, the evil spirit can't come into you, but the evil spirit can influence you. When you see police officers shoot men that are already on the ground, already chained up, an evil spirit... <laughs> I mean, it's supposed to be a threat, right? Man, face down with six officers' knees on him, handcuffed behind him, and they're hollering, stop resisting. They're being controlled by an evil spirit. You see, you just can't give some people power. If you give some people power, they will go out of their way to abuse it every single time. This man is in the graveyard, he's crying, he's cutting himself, and he's running off people. <laughs> he's breaking stuff. He's living in the graveyard. I told you two weeks ago, it would be okay if it was a snake in the graveyard, a dog or a hog in the graveyard, but this is a man living in the graveyard. He's crying out loud, cutting himself. But then when you get to verse number six, something miraculously happened. This man that was crazy, this man that was out of his mind, ran to Jesus, bowed down and worshiped him. Look at verse number six. When he saw Jesus, first of all, he saw Jesus. Secondly, Jesus was afar off. He ran and worshiped him. What happened to this man? This dude was out of his mind. He was crazy. He had supernatural powers. And then he humbles himself before Jesus. That says to us, regardless of what condition you're in, it's a blessing when you humble yourself before Jesus. It is an awesome, amazing blessing just to humble yourself before Jesus. He said he ran to Jesus bowed down and worshiped him. Then he cries out. Look at verse number seven. He cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Even the demons know who Jesus is. And we got folk on the, in the 21st century that don't even know who Jesus is. Jesus knows you, and you ought to know Jesus. But there are people in the 21st century that's not even crazy. They don't think anyway. And they don't even recognize Jesus. This man running crazy in the graveyard, out of his mind, living in the graveyard, runs to Jesus and calls his name. 
Even a crazy man knows that there's power in Jesus' name. Even a man out of his mind knows that there's power in the name of Jesus. And then he says, Son of the Most High God. He recognizes Jesus by name, then he recognizes Jesus by title. So he respects Jesus. We ought to just respect Jesus. Just, just respect him. Just, just Respect him, and then he can make a difference in your life. We talked about hermeneutics and homiletics, right? What is hermeneutics? I don't want to have to call on you, so just go ahead and tell me. What is hermeneutics? Who's talking? Somebody that's not sure? Oh, so what's, what's the term? <laughs> what is hermeneutics? Hermeneutics. Sister David spelled hermeneutics for us real slowly, two, three times for us real slowly. Hermeneutics. There's only one. H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. What does that spell? Hermeneutics. Okay, spell it two more times for us real slowly. What is that word? Hermeneutics. Sister Woods, what does that word mean? To prepare. To prepare your message, right? When we're talking about evangelism, we talked about preparation is 90% of the pre before you get to the presentation. Soul winning is 90% is of your of 90% of your soul winning experience ought to be preparation. So the teachers of this church, they spend, they told me last week they didn't do the Saturday night special on us. <laughs> What's the Saturday night special, Brother, Brother Whitlock? What's the Saturday night special? Are you familiar with the Saturday night special? I am, but I don't do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's the Saturday night special? When you wait until Saturday to get all your preparation for Saturday night special. Okay, for Sunday morning. So the Saturday night special is when you, you go all week long and you wait to Saturday to prepare your message for Sunday morning. Whether it's teaching, whether it's preaching, whether it's witnessing, whether it's how to treat people, you have to start way ahead of time. I've said to you that even when you're looking at the text, you need to look at the text and read it aloud to yourself at least 50 times. So when the wind blows your paper away, you just keep on moving. If the wind blows your paper away and you have to stop and search and look, something wrong. And everybody have different preparation style. Everybody have different presentation style. What is homiletics? Who's going to tell us what's homiletics? Go ahead and get yours in now so you won't have to talk later on now. Anybody? Is presentation, right? Homiletics. Homiletics. Spell that word for us. This is with love. Homiletics. H O M I L E T I C S. What is that word? Homiletics. Spell it for us real slowly again, please. H O M I L E T I C S. That's slow there. Amen. That's what is that word? Homiletics. <laughs> homiletics, right? What is, Brother Whitlock, what is homiletics? It is the presentation, right? So we do hermeneutics when we study the word and prepare the word, and we do homiletics when we present the word. What am I doing right now? Okay, I'm doing the presentation. I am doing homiletics, right? So your hermeneutics has to be accurate in order for your homiletics to be clear. Yes? So, when we look at this text, this man is running in the graveyard. yard. How many times do you think I've read this story? 50 plus. Over the years, of 31 years of preaching, how many times have I read this story? Over and over again. And every time I get a different congregation, I preach that same sermon. Did you know that? 
The same things that preachers come and preach here, they preach it somewhere else. One preacher was like, I'm trying to figure out how I preached this here before. <laughs> but every time you do your legitimate hermeneutics, hermeneutics rather, when you do your legitimate hermeneutics, every time God speaks something different. Are you with me? So when we look at this man running crazy in the graveyard, it gets to verse number six and we find out that this man does have an humble spirit. But he did not have that spirit until he met Jesus. Guess what? You wasn't who you are now until you met Jesus. I guarantee. Once you met Jesus, you could not be the same. You were never the same. Once you meet Jesus. So when he meets Jesus, he bows down, he worships Jesus, and then he starts talking. He no longer cutting himself. He's no longer breaking up stuff. Now he's talking to Jesus. Let me tell you, when you see, look at he said, it says he saw Jesus, he ran, and he worshiped him. Once you see Jesus for who Jesus is, guess what? You can't be the same. If you're not worshiping him, you need to ask yourself a question. Did I really see Jesus? Did I really come in contact with Jesus? Because this man was worst of the worst. And as we continue to read this passage, we'll see that even the town folk were enjoying him as long as he was crazy. Because guess what? As long as people can look down on you, then they make themselves be. Let's read for verse 7. I implore you, by God, you do not torment me. Not only did he respect Jesus, he knew the power of Jesus. The devil has power, but God has all power. He is all right. So they begged of him, please don't. Don't torment us. Don't kill us. Don't put us through stuff. Verse number eight. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked, what is your name? Listen, what is your name? Your name dictates what you do. Your name dictates how you act. You all have heard it over and over again. Every time I got ready to go out as a teenager, daddy would call me in the back room where my sisters and my brothers couldn't hear me and say, look, you are a Davis. When you leave here, I want my name to be good when you return. He said, you're not a weeks, you're not a coal, you're not a fuller, you're not an oar, you are a Davis. And he says, I have a good name. When I get back, I still want to have a good name. When you get back, I still want to have a good name. There is just some about your name. When you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the first thing they did, brought them over there and changed their names. The next thing they did is change their music. The devil is having a field day with young people in their music. In my day, heavy metal was something that you need to stay away from because it messed up your mind. <laughs> Had Caucasian children committing suicide because of heavy metal music. Now we have music in our community that make men talk all up on the women's clothes. Watch your music. Keep your good name. A good name is rather to be chosen than silver and gold. He asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion for they are many. Legions. For they are men. Theologians believe that the word legions mean that there are thousands upon thousands of demons in this man. This man didn't just have one demon. He had thousands of them. And we talk about the woman in the Bible that had seven demons. She had nothing compared to this man running crazy in the graveyard. He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. King James Version 
asked, what is your name? And the King James says that we are legion, we are many, that means we are thousands. Also, he begged him honestly that he would not send them out of the country. And here they are. That's just like the devil, isn't it? Now, he or she has killed someone. He or she has tormented someone. But he or she want mercy. Have you ever seen that? Memphis, Tennessee. Cops killed one man. All of them looked alike. But now they want mercy. Cop in Florida rapes 14 black women. When they sentence him to prison, he cries like a baby. If I had been a judge, I'd say, shut up! You don't deserve to cry. Stop crying in my court. It's because whenever we mess up, we do want mercy. And the thing about it is, God tells us to have mercy. Because God has given us mercy. How long did God put up with you before you came on in? How many times you said, God, let me just do one more time? And then one more time turn into ten more times. And Lord, this is the last time. We sound like we got the, 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 the wino theology going. God, if you let me out of this one, I never drink another day. God, if you get me out of this one, I never pick up another cognac. I never, I never pick up another Hennessy. I never pick up any more white poke if you get me out of this one. And then your buddy comes by and says, man, in order to get rid of a good drunk, you got to take another drink to chase it. Anybody can identify me? Is that just in my neighborhood? So he says, whatever you do, don't put us out. Let us stay here for a while. Now a large herd of swines were feeding there near the mountain. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once, Jesus gave them permission. Jesus is almighty, so he can give permission. He is almighty. Jesus has almighty power. So even the, even the demons ask for permission. We don't even ask. Jesus, should I go here? Jesus, should I do this? God, should I do this? The demons have to get permission. But we are so smart, we don't need permission. The large herd of swine was, was there near the mountains. So all of the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits, the unclean spirits, let me show, let me stop here and let you know. When you look back at previous verses, it talks about I, talks about me as if it's only one. I want to tell you, even the spirits will try to fool you. Now he says, the unclean spirits, the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There was about how many? Two thousand of them. People, people used to joke about having three, four different, seven different personalities. Sometimes I ask folk at the church, you take your medicine today? <laughs> which one showed up today? <laughs> which one? Just tell me which one I'm dealing with so I know how to deal with this one. This man had thousands of demons. Theologians believe at least 2,000. One demon tell him to do this, another demon tell him to do this, and one demon had to do this, and one demon had to do that. Can you imagine having to obey thousands and 2,000 demons? 
in control of your mind, your body. Some people say, I hear voices in my head. Let me tell you, Jesus can fix that. Stay on your medication and trust Jesus to fix it. Jesus gave them permission. They went into the swine. There was about 2,000 of them in the herd, ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned it in the sea. Here it paints a picture that the demons are parasites. They are hitchhikers. They have to have a body to live in. Don't let them live in you. Don't let them influence you. you Gotta have a body. When the swine died, they died. Now some people have used this passage to say you should not eat hog. Because they are demon possessed. Let me just make it perfectly clear. If you choose not to eat hog, don't let this passage be the influencer. Because the Bible says that these demons ran into the hogs and then the hogs committed suicide because the demons was in them and these hogs were demon possessed, not your hog. Now let me tell you, I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't grow up eating fat back. <laughs> Greasy cracklings. <laughs> I mean, in the country where I grew up, I mean, in, on, on the plantation where I grew up, where my daddy was a sharecropper, let me tell you, the whole neighborhood got together. And we had a hog killing good time right around when it got cold, it was hog killing time. I walked in the house the other day, Sister Davis, you see, when you live in, in more than one story, it's hard to regulate the air. I walked in the house the other day. I said, Sister David, it's hog killing time. She acted like she'd been in the city all her life. <laughs> Act like she didn't know what I'm talking about. It was so cold in there, ice stickers was falling off my nose when I walked in the room. She just died now. <laughs> when it gets cold, it's time to kill hogs. So don't let this passage deter you from hogs, but if the doctor say you need to stop eating hogs, stop eating hogs. I dare tell you, don't wait till the doctor tell you. <laughs> Get it under control first. Some people wait until a week before they have to go to the doctor. Then they start eating right. They start exercising. As if it's a big thing to go hear the doctor say your blood pressure is under control. Your health is good. They want to get a gold star for something they did for one week. But let me tell you, let me serve notice on you. It didn't take you a week to get that way. It's not going to take a week. To, it's going to take more than a week to get rid of it. Oh, I got to get in shape. I got to go see my doctor. The Bible said these hogs ran down into the sea and they died there. They drowned right there in the sea. Verse 14. So those who fed the swine, <laughs> they got attitude, those who fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what was that, that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw that one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting. Now this guy was running around. He's sitting and clothed. He was naked. And in his right mind. What happened? He met Jesus. He recognized Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. He, act, he actually... Uh, adjusted his life because he met Jesus. Paul says, in, Paul says in 2 Corinthians that you need to understand that when you are a new man in Christ, you are a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. The right translation is becoming new. Somebody said, thank the Lord is the right translation becoming new. Because when you read it, it says, 
Old things have become new as if it just stopped overnight. But you know, you don't get rid of sin all at once, do you? Some people say, I went, I didn't have to go to AA. I just quit cold turkey. Well, God bless you, whole heap in a prayer. But we take we take our sin like we take our clothes, one stitch at a time. We have to get past some things, we have to get over some things. But God is the only one can help us get over it. We need to meet Jesus. Let me tell you, children would not be abandoned as they are if their parents knew Jesus. I didn't say if their parents were in church. I said if their parents knew Jesus. <laughs> Steve Harvey asked the question, what's the best place to find, find a man? <laughs> One girl said club. Another girl said homeowners association. One girl said church. He said, wait a minute, hold up. And then he went on to talk about the men that are in church and not what they all cracked up to be. That's why I'm not saying meet a man in church. I'm saying meet a man in Jesus. You, you, need to, you, need to get, you need to get that salvation story and then ask him again and again, see if the story is going to change. You need to be born again. Born by Jesus Christ. Man, Sister Davis, some 24 years ago, I said, I need you. To write your salvation story. <laughs> Had a little attitude, brother, with love. <coughs> I know I'm saying. I don't have to put that in writing for you. I just went home and showed back up the next day. <laughs> Here it is. At least I knew she knew what salvation was. <laughs> Amen? So we, we need to make sure that we don't just get our friends and our relatives comment on somebody we're going to do business with, somebody we're going to hang out with, somebody we're going to do some things with. We need to make sure that we get somebody who's hanging out with Jesus. With Jesus. It's important that we know somebody who knows Jesus. Because if they don't know Jesus, they're going to lead you far away from him. Sister Brown, you're going to get your salvation story ready. <laughs> Sister Brown, you asked for that salvation story already. Look at that girl. Look what you got for coming to Bible study. <laughs> she she going she to say, I'm going to drive tonight. You, you make sure you write it as we ride. <laughs> yeah, got to have that salvation story. Amen. And then you got a testimony. Make sure it's real. Make sure they know what they're talking about. Verse number 14, so, so those who fed the swine, fed, who fled, fed the swine, fed, they fled, I mean they ran, and they told the people in the city and in the country what had happened. And they went out to see what had happened. Verse 15, then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the le legions sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were what? They were afraid. Something wrong with that picture. What's wrong with that? Why were they afraid? Y'all don't see anything wrong with them being afraid? They, they, they got used to seeing a man acting a fool. <laughs> they, got, they got used to it. And not only did they get used to it, they got pleasure from it. They should have been afraid when the guy was breaking chains, when he was breaking shackles. They got afraid when the guy was clothed, sitting, and in his right mind. Let me tell you, don't take for granted that you're in your right mind. You need to be thanking God Every day, every second of the day, that you are clothed, meaning you got some clothes on. Meaning you got a mind to put some clothes on. Clothed and that you are sitting and not running crazy in the graveyard. And that you are in your right mind. 
Now, I just want to warn you. Some folk think they're in their right mind. They're in somebody else's mind. When you're in your right mind, you would do godly things. You would act godly. You would say godly things. So this man is sitting, clothing in his right mind, and they are now afraid. All of a sudden, they're afraid. Why were they afraid? Let's see. They were afraid. Sitting, clothed in his right mind. They were afraid. And those who, and those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been possessed, demon possessed, and about the swine. Now they got testimonies now. Then they became, they began to plead with him to depart from their region. This making sense to you? The doctor showed up. The doctor healed the man. And after the doctor healed the man, after the doctor did his job, then they want the doctor to get out of town. Everybody with me? When the doctor healed the man, now they want the doctor to leave town. When the doctor got rid of the demons that was frightening everybody, now they want the doctor to leave town. Let's see. Depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. Check this out. And he departed and be began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him in all love. What happens is, Jesus fixes this man up. Jesus saves this man. Matter of fact, he saves this man's life. And he was so grateful. He decided he want to go with Jesus. When Jesus turned your life around, you need to want to stay with Jesus. But Jesus has called all of us. He has called us to do something after he has blessed us. Look what Jesus said. No, go back home. Why go home? Because those are the folk who know you. And I'm a living witness. The people who know you, first of all, they're going to remind you of what you used to be. They're going to remind you. Girl, you just don't know. Girl, didn't we used to hang out together? Did, you know we used to make six clubs on one night? Instead of saying, God bless you. I'm so glad that you're home. I'm so glad that you're saved. I'm so glad that you, your life has been turned around. So they'll spend a good six years saying, remember what you used to do? Remember how you used to get so drunk we used to barely make it home? The devil will always point out the bad things in your life. And they will always point to that one bad thing you ever done. And for you Christians, don't slip up and cuss. First thing they're going to say is, and you call yourself a Christian. And don't let a preacher cuss. You can call yourself a preacher. Don't even let the preacher get a slip of the tongue. You call yourself a godly person. But let me tell you something. Romans 3.23 says, we all sin. It didn't say y'all sin. It said we all sin. We all fall short. We all uh, miss the mark. We all miss the target. And that's why we need Jesus. 
Is there anybody in the house that does not need Jesus? Any, just one person. Is there anybody online who does not need Jesus? If you, if you don't need him, let me know. And I'll tell you, you need him worst of all. <laughs> if you've gotten to the point where you have come to, to the point where you don't need Jesus at all, telling God, man, I, I, want, I want all the men at Sunday school. I want all the men to be engaged. I want all the men focused. I want all the men to make sure that, that, that we live in safety around here. I mean, I'm just going on laying out my list. The one thing he stuck to, I don't have to go to Sunday school. I went to Sunday school as a boy. I went to Sunday school all my life. I done learned everything I need to know in Sunday school. If I wasn't the pastor, I would have really told him. You the biggest idiot I ever seen in my life. I don't need no Sunday school. I, I, I know all there is to learn about Sunday school. Well, when you stop learning about God, you're going to be out of here. Yeah. Whenever you know everything you need to know about God, you need to look at the face of God and you're going to be out of here. I, I got concerned about the brother. Concerned that, that he is so messed up in his mind that he really actually believed this. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So when he changed, he wanted to spend time with Jesus. He wanted to be with Jesus. Now Jesus is his mentor. Jesus is his savior. Jesus is his Lord. He's somebody that he can look up to. Everybody else tried to chain me up, but Jesus set me free. Amen. Amen. When Jesus changed your life, he wants you to move forward and do something with your life. Amen. He wants you to go. He says, go back home. And when you get home, it's going to be automatic. You're going to be a witness for me. You're going to run and tell people of God's goodness. He says, go back home. And when you go back home, you tell them what has happened and the good things that the Lord has done for you. Be a witness. Tell somebody of God's goodness. Tell somebody of how God has brought you out and made a difference in your life. Songwriter said, I said I wasn't going to tell anybody. But I just couldn't keep it to myself. Well, let me say it like a song. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody. But I just couldn't keep it to myself. Jeremiah said, I decided I was going to go home. I wasn't going to show back up at that church. I'm tired of talking to those people. They ain't getting it anyway. God, I'm through with it. And the, the time Jeremiah got home, Jeremiah said, woo me. It's like fire. Shut up in my bone. I can't keep it to myself. And you don't have to be a preacher. You've been saved. You've been sanctified. You've been ooh, filled with his precious Holy Ghost. You got to run and tell somebody about the goodness of God. Can't keep it to myself. You got to tell somebody. Questions or comments? Remember now, when there is homiletics, there's an exchange. Brother Miles said there's a, there's a, a call and response. Brother Miles said there's some interaction. And, and they, they teach you in seminary, if you can't get 30% of, of your time in interaction, you haven't done a good job. So have I been lecturing tonight? Or have I been teaching tonight? <sighs> have you been interacting? Are there any questions? Any comments? Now that you are hermeneutically sound, you can challenge the teacher. One thing that I, I do want to list out, uh, bring up that, that I mentioned last week, um, that is that <clears throat> hermeneutics creates an atmosphere for homiletics to be three things. Homiletically, you have to be accurate. I don't know how you got that listed in your notes. You have to be accurate. Number two, you must be clear. And number three, you must be relevant. You must be accurate. You must be clear. You must be relevant. You must be clear. You must be accurate. You must be relevant. Accurate means that you're telling the word the way God would have it. Clear means that people understand what you're saying. Relevant means that you're in these times that we are in today. Things that are happening, the, the language we speak, must be accurate, must be clear, must be relevant. 
Another thing that I said, there are five, five things that you need to keep in every homiletical uh, presentation. Exordium. What's an exordium? Exordium. Exordium. This is going to be on the test, y'all. That which is said first. That which is said first. When you see preachers or teachers get up uh, on Sunday at 9 o'clock, one guy will get up and say, okay, it's 9 o'clock. That's their exodium. Some people get up and they start talking and recognizing people. That's their exodium. That which is said first, regardless of what it is. And then when we go to other churches and say, giving honor to God, giving giving honor to the pastor, giving honor to the trustees. You know, there's one thing in a black church, you're going to get an exordium every time. I was, I was uh, officiating a funeral, and I said, now look, this is two minutes. The presentation must be two minutes. I, get, I have a stop clock. I'm, on, I'm watching the clock. Two minutes is 120 seconds. It's not like when you say, I haven't seen you in a minute. I'm talking about 120 seconds. And if you decide to sing a song, make sure at 118 seconds you cutting that song off. <laughs> so since I had set the ground rule, about the third person up, the lady could walk all the way from the back. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. I said, let me look at my clock now. She's already started. It's what it said first, the very first thing you said. Some people use their, their, very, their exodium to test the microphone. Some people exodium is to pray. Is that what it says first. Then you have the introduction. What is the introduction? The introduction we do what? Who is she talking to? She ain't talking to us. <laughs> it look like I'm waking up out of sleep. <laughs> So, what, Sister Woods, what's the introduction? Yeah, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you about, right? In the introduction, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk about one, two, three things. When I stood up, I said, we're going to talk about uh, Mark chapter 5. We're going to deal with hermeneutics and we deal with homiletics, right? So, the introduction is, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. Then, the body. The body is another word for the body. You may want to write this down. It's called argumentum. A G U A G R. I'm sorry, let's start over. A G R U M E N T U M. A G R U M E N T U M. Argumentum. That is the body. That is when you argue your case. That is when you state your case. It's the argumentum. You have done the exodium. You have done the introduction. And now I'm doing the argumentum, which is the body. Then there is the clothing or the conclusion or memory. Some people swap those two around. Memory or conclusion. Let's talk about the memory first. The memory is what? The tells how it applied in us. Tell us how it's applied in the text. When we talk about memory in the text, it applied to this man running crazy in the graveyard because his life was changed. And then what preachers usually do, what teachers usually do, is they go from what happened to the man in the text and what happened to me. They talk about that. And then the clothes. What do the clothes do? The conclusion is the clothes. I'm sorry. The conclusion or the clothing. It restates what you said. In the introduction, you told them what you're going to say. In the argumentum or the body, you said it. And in the conclusion, I restate what I've said. And therefore, you have three chances to get it. Amen? And so, therefore, we can move from there to a great homiletical presentation. Amen? So, everybody got this story down, right? You read it 50 times between last Wednesday and this Wednesday. Don't raise your hand because God still got it raining out there. Don't raise your hand. It's still raining. And there may be some lightning and maybe some thunder. Questions, comments, questions or comments. No questions, no comments. The door of the church is open. You got a question? Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, hermeneutics, hermeneutics and homiletics. Right, homiletics.
Yes. Yes, that's, I'm not sure how you labeled it in your notes. Somebody help me. What, what do you have here? Say, say those things again, those five things. Oh, when I started off with hermeneutics and hermeneutics, uh, we're talking about how, how it needs to apply to your life as an end point, yes. So we need to make sure that we understand that every passage of scripture ought to apply somewhere to our lives. Because you don't come to church just to come to church, right? You come to church to learn so it can apply to your life. How can you apply to your life? Did anybody get anything tonight that can apply to their life? Tell me somebody. I guess, did you get anything tonight that, that apply to your life? Anybody? Anybody? Well, I learned about the, about the story that was just going on with that this man. He was, he was he had the he had the devil there. Mm-hmm. And he, he he recognized who Jesus was and he knew where to go to, to remove these demons out of him. Okay. When you meet Jesus, Jesus is a he, he put the demons on him. I'm telling you, Jesus knows how to put the demons on the road. Good God Almighty. Any other comments or questions? Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Brother Miles, you got something you're about to say? You think about saying something? Or you, you think you ought to say something? No, sir. Oh, okay. I just checked. <laughs> uh, you know, teachers, teachers, want, teachers want other people to talk when they teach, you know, huh? Ah, you just make sure you get started on that salvation story before you get out of here. <laughs> tell, them, tell them about Jesus and how he died on Calvary and rose from the dead and, and how you trusted in their Savior. That leads us to the invitation. If you're here tonight and you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity to get to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. All you have to do is just believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins. That he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. If you want to trust him tonight, just bow your head with me and repeat after me. And invite Jesus into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. Also, our brother here tonight is asked for prayer. I'm going to answer all the men to come and let's let's take our brother before the Lord and pray. Amen. Take care of the things that you need to take care of, Lord. 
and turn towards you or whatever it's called. But we can't do anything. But we know that you can. And so Lord, we ask that you that you would be there. We ask that you would deliver whatever it's called. We ask that you would grant that which will bring you glory whatever it's called. So Lord, we just give you all the glory right now. We give you all the praise. Do, do that whatever it's called. That which you can only do. And we just give it all in your hands. And these things are actually in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to get his number and uh, to stand with the brother, walk with them. But we know that God can do anything but say it all. Thank you, Brother D. Edward. Right? D. Edward Jefferson. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Thank Lord, so much. For, for being here with us. God, you know, God is good. Thank you, sir. Amen. You can be here. I can be anywhere. Amen. Amen. But, but God, I, I mean, I was, I drove around, I walked around, and, uh, and I prayed, and I just... I haven't been. I mean, that's my father. You know, we want to see yeah, you at church, man. That's my father. We welcome you. Thank you. We want to see you. These brothers are going to get your number and keep in touch with you. Amen. Amen. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord from time offering and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. It is offering time. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand, and that young man back there will run and bring it to you. Amen. Amen. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. For those of you who are giving electronically, you can give. You can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so. By mailing it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We ask you to bless every giver and bless every gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Lord. Be asked. Y'all better sing if you don't want me to sing. Bless him. Bless his, bless his holy name. Father God, we thank you now. While we stand to be dismissed. Are there any praise report or prayer requests? Praise report. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we pray for my cousin. Who we pray for you? We pray for you. So your cousin transitions, right? Amen. We pray for for the Derek family. Yes, ma'am. Rayshawn Maryland. Rayshawn Maryland. Rayshawn Maryland. We pray for the Derek family and and Rayshawn Maryland. Anybody else? Now, yes, sir. Praise report. Praise report. Wait a minute, Sister Dave, come up here, Sister Hughes. Run, Sister Hughes. Run, Sister Hughes. Hurry, Sister Hughes. Hurry, run, Sister Hughes. Help her up, Brother Miles. Help her up. Run, Sister Hughes. Run, Sister Hughes. Come on, Sister Hughes. Move like a young woman now. We got a praise report. We got a praise report. Amen. Don't, don't take too long to warm that on and up now. 
Amen. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I've been married to this wonderful woman today for 15 years. Married for 15 years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a praise report there. Hallelujah. 15 years. A man and a woman married for 15 years. Came from two different parts of the country with two different upbringings. Boy, God is an awesome God. I'm telling you. 15 years. Praise the Lord for the Whitlocks. For 15 years of marriage. Hallelujah. And she still smiles. I think she is. She actually likes to smile. Can't tell that they smile in these days. He may be doing like this, but he just want to recognize it. <laughs> Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you now. We honor your name. We bless your name, Father. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you will do, and what you're doing right now. We thank you, Father God, for Sister Marilyn. We ask you to bless her, keep her, heal her, strengthen her. Lord, we ask you to focus on her and give her your attention. We know, God, you are the great God. You're the great king. You're the one who heals us and makes us well. We pray for the Darrington family. We ask you to encourage them, to lift them up, to bless them, to focus on you and you alone. We pray that you comfort them, Father God, in such a way that they will feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father God, for the praise reports all over this room and all over this broadcast. We thank you, Lord, for the Whitlock, for 15 years of marriage. We thank you for a man and a woman who will dedicate themselves to you and dedicate themselves to each other. Now, Lord, we pray, Father God, that you continue to pray to bless our church to be a beacon of light in a cold and dark and dismal world. We pray for Brother D. Edwards, Father. We thank you for bringing him here today. We thank you for blessing his life. And, Lord, we thank you, Father God, that our church is available to reach men, women, boys, and girls but Jesus Christ. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us all sing together. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you so much for joining us.